gonna walk you through, demonstrate my sketching technique. And this is what I'm using for this year's Inktober. So I have over here a thumbnail. Today I am illustrating a traditionalist Lilliputian family. So this will be a family that kind of lives out in the deep woods, they do all their own hunting, they make all their own clothes. So I have a little thumbnail sketch here of a small family. And today I'm gonna draw that for you. And I'm gonna do that in time lapse because I am, as you guys know, ADHD, and it's very difficult for me to talk and explain while I draw and do a good job doing both. But I want to preface this, even more prefacing, by saying I already have a lot of my reference pulled up on Pinterest, so I'm referencing clothing, I'm getting ideas for clothes, that sort of thing. I have boards dedicated on Pinterest for that, so I don't have to make it up as I go along. Um, I really try to offload as much of that effort in various forms as possible, what with the thumbnail, and with having a Pinterest board, so I don't have to keep a mental image in my head. Because for me, that is the point of critical failure. If I try to keep it all in my head and I don't get it out onto paper, it never looks right. So there are various techniques for sketching. I'm sure you've already got your own, but when I draw traditionally, I typically use a non-photo blue pencil or other type of colored lead. This has red lead in it. And the non-photo blue pencil used to be when you scanned it, when you photocopied it, it wasn't uh, subtle enough to be able to pick that up. Now scanners can, but it's very easy to drop the blue lines. And I have tutorials over on netosoup.blogspot.com for how to do that. Um, for today's demonstration, we're going to be doing a sketch and we're also going to be doing ink washes and I have videos or a video where I show you guys how to prepare ink wash pins. So these are the additional materials I'm going to use later on in our demonstration. So I hope you guys are excited and if there's ever something I do that you have questions about, let me know in the comments below. I'm happy to answer or do a follow-up video. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of transpose this base sketch over here onto my mixed media paper. And all I'm really aiming for right now is to figure out placement. Because if I have to erase a bunch, I don't want to spend a lot of time and then have to get rid of something I spent a lot of time on. So really, it's just basic placement. And I'm using these kind of curved lines as the start of my, sort of my line of gesture. So unfortunately, I know you guys can't see it super well. Um, normally I would switch over to a darker lead, but I'm doing my Inktober consistent, so we're just gonna have to roll with this. And I'm actually gonna grab a secondary camera and get a close up for, so that you guys can see this a little bit better, hopefully. But as you can see, I kind of just blocked everything in. Once everything is kind of blocked in satisfactorily, then I can go ahead and start refining the forms. And the way I'm doing Inktober, I am kind of erasing all of my construction stuff and kind of just leaving, I'll show you guys what I'm talking about, kind of just leaving the main sketch, which is not my favorite way of working because usually I feel like the ink should carry that. But unfortunately, the blue, though there's wax in these non-photo blue slash any color lead you use, there's gonna be wax in it and that can cause a little bit of a resist. So unless I want like lots of construction lines showing up all over the place, I have to get rid of the majority of them. So typically when I'm working in this method, I'm gonna work from right to left. And I also have a piece of tracing paper here to serve as a cover sheet. My hands are super squeaky clean though, because I did just take a bath, but you know, it's still good to use protection. So I'm gonna start over here, and this little fellow is supposed to be, or is going to be, a chipmunk, because I've just been trying to draw as many pets as possible for this volume of Lilliputian living. So I'm just kind of sketching in basic shapes from a reference image that I have pulled up. And when in doubt, references your best friend. That is a good time to use it. Had a couple of people ask me how to use reference. And if you guys would really like to do a blog post or video on that, um, 
But the TLDR is like, if you're using it for an illustration and you're not tracing it, that's fine. Um, if you took the photo yourself, you own the copyright to the photo, if you have permission to use the photo, then you can do what you like with the photo. I would say the only, the only caveat is don't lie to people and tell them you did it without any reference, right? Like be cool. But otherwise, you know, if you have the right to use the image or if you're making massive changes to the, to the original, then you're probably good to go. In Japan, they sell um, just books of like stock poses, stock photos, stock drawings that are intended for comic artists to kind of recreate or to photocopy. They even sell tones that are, you know, like of clouds or of trees, what have you. So, you know, if you're over here kind of stressing out about like, well, you know, Am I abusing this reference? Just keep in mind that like, like Dover, for example, publishes um, copyright free stock that you can use in your illustrations that you can reference. So, you know, there are companies here that also offer that as well. But again, as long as you don't try to pass it off as like entirely your original creation, it's, and as long as you're not, I mean, if it's yours, if you have the right to use it, tracing it is one thing. Or if you're just trying to get like the general idea, tracing is fine. The only time tracing is really a problem is when you're passing it off as your own. Now, referencing somebody else's art, that can be a whole other kettle of fish. So I'm really just talking about stuff that's released with the intention of people referencing it and photos that you have the rights to use. Okay, so I have a basic sketch of our little chipmunk friend. And I did this with just some very simple kind of blobby shapes. I'll leave this little fella as is. And well, I'm also gonna clean up its face. I'm gonna come back in and add more details later. But for now, this is fine. Cause I wanna kind of get a base sketch of the whole image down before I start tightening things up too much. So we are working from left to right. I'm gonna start in now on the father and he's holding a toddler. So I'm gonna go to Google and look up reference for men holding toddlers. And really the whole point of using reference is to make your, whatever you're doing stronger, more realistic, to make the art you're creating better art. And I will say, if your favorite artist claims they don't use reference and they aren't like completely an abstract artist, I'm gonna call bull. I would say they're lying. Maybe they don't consider what they're doing reference. Maybe they are telling you that to kind of keep you a, a block behind, a lap behind, but most artists, especially illustrators, use reference. And I say that because there's always, like once a year, there's discourse on like whether or not using reference is like legit. Y'all, I have an MFA from SCAD, okay? Like that's pretty legit. I've been making comics for like 20 years. I've been working professionally for like seven. That's pretty legit. We've reviewed hundreds of comic artists on this channel. I used to be on the SQL Lab podcast. Like, I'm not saying I am the expert, but I'm saying you can trust me when I say that using reference is a legitimate way. I don't even know why I'm getting upset. Shouldn't I be getting upset over Inktober discourse instead of, instead of, is reference okay? Discourse, yes, reference is okay. Stop letting people lie to you. Look up the camera obscura. That's what the Renaissance masters used, like Da Vinci used to transpose human images onto their canvas so they could trace that so that they had good, <laughs> come on y'all. At least if you're gonna say using reference is wrong, at least be familiar enough with art history to know that we've been doing using reference for a really long time. Anyway, I'm not even talking about what I'm supposed to be talking about. So I'm also blocking in the kid's figure because the kid, dad is holding the kid. So the two figures are kind of interconnected. 
And I'm actually kind of getting tighter than I want to because I'm so busy getting, catching an attitude about whether or not it's okay to use reference. I swear, I'd like to see the portfolios of the artists who say don't use reference. And I'd also like to see like where they got that cockamamie idea from. They sure told us to use reference. So they being SCAD professors sure told us to use reference. So. I've also like never met an artist out in the wild who didn't admit, didn't cop to using reference. Maybe they didn't like admit it online for whatever reason. It doesn't make you weaker. It just means you don't have a photographic memory. I've also never met an employer who like specifically hired on the basis of you don't use reference. God, I could really go into this, sorry. All right, so um, I should really instead be taught, in fact, my plan was to do the figures in time-lapse. And I may, if I find this too distracting, I may switch over to that. But you guys see, I've kind of like done a skeletal form of the, the male figure here holding the child. And as I'm going, I'm kind of fleshing it out. But I really recommend for those of you who are less familiar and also not busy ranting about per, uh, reference, that you, you draw your skeletal first, you kind of figure out your gesture, and then you worry about, I mean, I always draw like this whole Inktober, I've been doing my heads wrong, like slightly off kilter. But I recommend you do your skeleton first, you figure out your gesture, and then you start fleshing things out. And I have a lot of tutorials on, um, on figure drawing. So if you miss something, you can definitely ask me in the comments below. I'd actually really appreciate you asking me. Um, because then I can kind of uh, fine tune and answer specific questions instead of kind of covering stuff over and over and over again. I can just demonstrate one thing. Another thing with the dad holding the child, I'm not referencing a specific picture. I have, I just did a Google search for like men holding uh, toddlers. And honestly, the best reference I have found is a combination of a woman holding her toddler and a guy holding his like, I don't know, nine month old baby. So I've kind of combined the two. And you know, for stuff you have a lot of experience with, like let's say you have a toddler, you know, you can get your, your partner, if you have a partner to hold the kid for you and take photos of that or work from that. Um, Ooh, I drew the dad short. That's okay, but I'm gonna need to like stay. I mean, he can be in the background too. He's got kind of a short torso. Do I care about that? I tend to draw people with overly long torsos and torsos come in, not torso legs, his legs are short. Um, people come in all shapes and sizes, so I'll leave it, we'll see. All right, now I'm starting in on the mother. I was thinking she could be more the hunter type in this family because yeah, the Lilliputian societies in Seven Inch Kara and there's various types, they don't really have gender roles because um, they tend to have limited populations. So everybody has to work uh, to have roles that like are gender-based is wasting skill and potential. I'm not saying like, if you are a woman who likes to cook, that's a waste. I'm saying if you're a guy who likes to cook and you're in a family where only the women cook, obviously that's a waste. So for Lilliputian society, it's kind of based on like interest and ability. And she's the one who's got the skills. So she's the one who goes out and does it. And these aren't specific characters either. Um, I do, when I'm doing Inktober character designs, I do try to think about what kind of person this would be. So this isn't just like generic. I mean, it is kind of generic, but it's not like, you know, just the first thing that comes off the top of my head. I usually try to think about it. And if I can kind of subvert expectations, I'll usually go for that when, when feasible. Okay, so I'm kind of blocking in her skeleton now. 
I really hope that someone can perform some editing magic so that you guys can kind of see the color a little bit better. All right, so I kind of have her skeletal gesture. She's standing a little in front of him. That's nice. We've got like, at least they're not all standing on like the same line. Now I have to do something with their five, their five-year-old kid. I draw a lot of girls, so I was kind of thinking I would do all of their kids as boys. Their two children as boys. And I draw a lot of girls because A, I'm female. So, you know, I have a vested interest in seeing a variety of women and girls represented. So, you know, I can contribute to that. Uh, also, it's what I'm familiar with, what I'm comfortable with, since I can be my own reference and I can draw from my own experience. I kind of want to give him a boy. Maybe he should hold a, have a slingshot. Also, in general, I try to give them something to do with their hands. So yeah, there's, in my opinion, there's not a lot of girl-centric media that isn't like My Little Pony, and not that there's anything wrong with My Little Pony, but that's not for every girl. So I try to do my bit by creating the sort of media I would want to see, and that's what 7-inch Kara is. It's the sort of comic I would want to read, and I'd still want to read. Okay, so dad is almost fleshed out. Um, at least his, his structure sketched out. Toddler is basically in a tight skeletal form. Mom is in a tight skeletal form. Son is somewhere between being fleshed out. I know. Oh, I want to draw this kid waving because this is like my generic Carol wave. <laughs> um, that's okay. Sometimes I try to avoid having them look directly at the audience because it's less of a narrative when you do it like that. I am more like a sitcom where, you know, womp womp, they look at the audience, but that's okay. I think my last couple, they were not looking at the audience at all. Have them keep throwing something. It has monkey arms. I mean, so do I, so that's just long, really long arms. All right, so I have here kind of the basic sketch of this whole family. My next step is going to be to tighten this sketch up, so flesh out the forms using constructive human anatomy, which I've demonstrated for you guys on numerous occasions, so I'll just link one of those. Um, I will walk you through it, but I can also link that. Then we're gonna erase a lot of this and start putting clothes on them. Now, I wouldn't always erase all this underlying stuff, but because I'm doing ink wash on top of these, like I explained earlier, it does cause a resist. So it is time to start fleshing out our figures and to start clothing our figures and also to, you know, design their hair, their faces, etc. So I'm going to start just by kind of fleshing out the figures. And at this point, it's just mostly kind of curvy cylinders. So if you can do curvy cylinders, you can do arms and legs. And feet are mostly triangular wedges. And I use the curves on the ends of the, of the cylinders to kind of help foreshorten and kind of show direction. So mom would be pretty muscular, so I should start out by making my cylinders fairly robust. So my next step for this particular process is to erase all these excess lines. I'm gonna have to erase them at some point anyway. It's better if I just start cleaning it up as I go along. And it's a pretty time consuming and honestly kind of annoying part of the process. Certainly not my favorite. Well, we often make sacrifices to make the sort of art we want to make, even something as mundane as spending forever erasing. And I don't think I really need to show you guys how to erase. I think you guys got that figured out. I will go over kind of briefly the erasers that I'm using for this. 
Um, I did try using an electric eraser and in some instances that's going to be a lot faster, but I noticed it also left kind of a rubbery residue on my paper that I had to use my nails to peel off. So, you know, if you really, really hate erasing and you really just want something quick, that could be a good way to go. Just keep in mind that you're going to be peeling it off with your nails. You might not even care. So I am using a small radar knock eraser. You could use um, a Tombow mono eraser, just any of these small kind of small area erasers. I also typically use a Pentel click erase. And then for larger areas, I have a Creative Mark white stroke. I really, really like these erasers. I also have an inexpensive drafting brush. Comes in handy, it means you're not scraping your hand across graphite or across lead and smearing and also getting hand oils all over your paper. All right, so I haven't erased all of my guidelines and honestly, I'm kind of loath to erase as many as I did because I really do use them when I'm placing clothing. It helps remind me of the gesture. It just kind of helps keep everything in place. So I hate having to erase them but that's just unfortunately part of the process. So I wanna give this cute little fellow a snack, something for him to mange on. So we're gonna draw him with the puffy cheeks. And we're gonna kinda work on just tightening things up a little bit more. So I'm gonna zoom in for you guys. And I'm going to start on the father's face. I don't actually have any reference for him. I don't even necessarily have anything particularly in mind. Which is not the best way to start. So I have a series of crosshairs. So we start with a sphere and then we bring that sphere down into kind of a spade shape. Then we subdivide the sphere in half horizontally and vertically. And then... We have kind of a circle slice here and we subdivide that as well. This is going to help us place the ears, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, etc. So I'm going to sketch in an oval right here in the middle of his face. This is the third eye and it helps me place the other two because your eyes are about one eye width apart. I'm also going to use this to help me place his hairline which is about halfway from the top of his head to his eye line. And don't worry if you can't really follow along too well. I do have videos where I explain this more in depth. And again, you can always ask me questions in the uh, comments below. So generally halfway down from this midpoint to the bottom of the face is the bottom of the nose. And then halfway from the bottom of the nose, to the bottom of the chin is where the mouth, where typically you would place the mouth. Now, usually when I'm blocking in things like noses, I use kind of a, a triangular shape. And I haven't even decided on his expression yet. So I'm just going to kind of fill in around there. He's going to end up looking kind of like Rowan, Kara's dad. Maybe this is one of his brothers. He comes from a family of like seven kids, so it could be one of his brothers. really like that cheek. And as I'm going, I'm also going to erase my guidelines because in the end, we want to, for this kind of illustration, we want to end up with as few guidelines as possible. Unfortunately, sometimes there's bycatch where you erase a lot more than you want to and then you have to redraw it like three times. kind of give them an unimpressed neutral expression. So I found some reference for a hairstyle I kind of like, so I'm going to start blocking it in. We'll see how it looks. It might not, might not work on him, but it's basically a guy with just long curly hair and his hair is basically just down which seems pretty in keeping for traditionalist Lilliputians. 
typically they have beards and facial hair. All right, with the facial hair, he's starting to look a little bit more like what I had in mind. And then I'll start not only doing his clothing, but also start designing the kid he's holding. Since the two are connected. And erasing as I go is honestly one of the most tedious things. I'm so reliant on, for the most part, uh, inking it and then erasing or not erasing at all and dropping it in scans. I really hate erasing. I do have reference for his clothes pulled up, but since I decided to draw him in kind of a loose fitting shirt holding a child, I don't exactly have reference for that. And it would be really helpful because the folds do fall in a certain way. So I'm just kind of having to use my, my best judgment, which is not always the best judgment, and kind of just guess. All right, I'm gonna switch over to the young child he's holding. Um, originally, I'd actually had these really cute little short pants pulled up, but you wouldn't even see them because his sleeve is billowy enough. So that's okay. We're gonna start in on the kid's face and the same principles apply. It's just in a different more compact. So we've got our third eye in the middle of the face, our two other eyes, other eyes, our two eyes on either side. Typically children have larger eyes, well rather it, children do have larger eyes in comparison to the rest of their faces because your eyes don't grow as you age. Let me give the kid a little Bump, bump, nose. A little open mouth. And then, don't like that. There we go. Start erasing some of the excess and then I'll start tightening it up a little bit. Give him curly hair like his dad. And I'm just kind of, when I draw any kind of hair, I usually think of it as masses and chunks and then I decide whether I want to break it down and work smaller. So like the bangs would be a chunk and then the back of the hair and then whether or not you want to have any like cowlicks or areas where the hair kind of does its own sort of thing. And a while back, I think I promised you guys hair tutorial. Not that I draw the greatest hair, but if you're just starting out, sometimes any instruction is better than figuring it out by yourself. Dad does not look impressed. I'm hoping the thought is more he's not impressed by the humans who have intruded on his life, you'd actually be pretty angry. Traditionalists don't like humans. And, you know, for not bad reason. We don't exactly have a history of being kind to small things. There's a reason they live out in the sticks, off the fat of the land. Okay, I want it to look like he's holding on. His arms are a little thin now. I'm not sure I like that expression. I may fix it. Maybe make him smile since he's looking up at his dad. Oh, and he's young enough that he would be missing some teeth. Always like drawing kids who are missing teeth. I think it's really cute. Actually, his older brother would also, his having come in, 
his older brothers are on their way out. Now I need a cute little outfit for this little dude. And you guys can probably see I'm getting some blue on my hand. That's why I'm using a cover sheet. It's not really to protect my hand. I don't so much care if I get blue lead, but it does smear and it, you know, there can, you can leave oils on the paper, thus causing areas of resist. Okay, so we need something for our little buddy here to wear. I have his shoulder pressed up against his dad. And I really like drawing family scenes, all kinds of different types of families. It's just something you know, really nice about, about drawing families, interacting together in a positive way. I think we don't get enough of that, so. That's a thing I definitely enjoy drawing. He is definitely bigger than the toddler I thought he was gonna be. He's more like a three-year-old. That's okay. So you have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Yeah, the folds in dad's shirt are really bugging me because they're not right. And some of it is something I can kind of address when I'm doing the ink wash. Some of it, I should probably try and outline it now. Come on, Dad, you could smile for your son. You love him, right? All right, we got Dad and one of his two boys. And traditionalist Lilliputians, you know, either way on shoes, usually the ones who go out hunting wear shoes. I mean, you need to, even if you're only seven inches tall. Kids can go either way. Kind of depends on what resources their parents have available. Draw a little length of rope hanging from dad's side. So basically I block it in as like a noodle and then I add kind of the thread. And I try to make sure that they alternate between which one goes in and which one goes out. Like, that kind of. So we're like about half done with the sketch. So while I had some ideas in my head, I went ahead and I just kind of free handed them in. I saw mom as having like really curly hair, maybe in darker skin um, and her hair kind of like short curly hair kind of spilling out from her hood. I thought that would be a really cute idea. I mean, in practicality, it would be annoying <laughs> because it would be really itchy, but maybe it keeps her warm if it's cold. I could definitely see myself doing that. Um, so she's got kind of a hood and kind of a short tunic with tall boots. And she's carrying a spear and it's gonna have a glass tip um, just because they can probably scavenge a lot of glass. Um, as for their son, I had put a couple little downy feathers in his hair because traditionalist Lilliputians are really big on wearing natural things. Um, and maybe he's the sort of precocious, energetic kid who just likes to collect like jay feathers or something. Um, he's also got a little bit of a capelet of fur. It's probably mouse fur, don't tell his chipmunk. Um, with uh, a nice wide belt. He'll probably be barefoot. He just seems like the kind of kid who would go barefoot. So this kid would be like the more adventurous of the two children, whereas this kid and probably takes after his mom. And whereas the, the three-year-old probably takes after his dad, more of a homebody. So kind of deciding who your characters are while you work can really help, um, help you draw them, help them come to life, help you care about them. If you kind of envision their personalities, envision their interactions, this, this boy would constantly be asking his mom to take 
him hunting with her. And she probably would on easier trips, but on bigger trips, she'd probably tell him to stay home with his dad. Whereas this little fellow here probably misses his mom like crazy, but is happy to stay at home with his dad and learn maybe how to weave or how to make rope, those sort of skills. So traditionalist Lilliputians are not really big on like surface decoration because or surface design on their own clothes. They might do that for their children's clothes, but they wouldn't do that for themselves. And that's because it takes time. So it's like an act of service, a gift of love, but it's not something they would value for themselves or feel the need to have like ornate clothing. Traditionalist Lilliputians, um, they don't really have big societies. They live in kind of small communal groups. They're a little bit distrustful of other Lilliputians, particularly Lilliputians that live in proximity with humans. So the fact that Kara's dad, Rowan, married a, a house slash townie Lilliputian got him disowned. I'm just kind of sketching in. It would be fun to indicate that this is glass. That's something that she would be able to sharpen and rehone very, very easily. It really wouldn't take much, but it could get deadly sharp. And she's got a couple of pouches on her. He doesn't need them. He doesn't really go out a whole lot. Just gonna quickly kind of sketch her fingers in. And she's probably kind of boisterous, good natured. Maybe I'll draw her like really, like she's got like a really cute face. So we have like the juxtaposition of like cool lady huntress, but also she's just really really cutesy. So you could definitely, you could definitely be that kind of a person. And especially when you got kids and a, and a life mate, a partner to take care of, you can definitely be both. Give her kind of a rounded chin. And I'll probably give them kind of darker, maybe even Middle Eastern uh, skin tones. Well, it's an ink wash, so ink wash. Uh, just because I really want to have a lot of different kinds of people represented in Lilliputian living. I, I want someone to be able to flip through volume one and volume two and kind of find someone they can identify with, either personality or uh, ethnicity. So. But yeah, uh, kind of figuring out the son and the mom's personalities has made this. I was getting a little worn out, kind of took a little bit of a brain break. And now I'm kind of excited to get back at it. And I'll give him kind of his dad's nose. And the little one then has mom's nose so that works out. And to be honest, I'm not really fond of the drawing order of operations I'm demonstrating today. The erasing puts a lot of wear and tear on my hand. And uh, I think if I were to do this again, I would uh, ink it like tight ink it and then do the ink wash rather than trying to treat the ink wash the way I do with like lineless watercolor or lineless markers. Cause it just doesn't really, especially with the blue, it just doesn't really work out the same way. And I was thinking the blue would be easier to drop than the red. And I've just kind of stuck with it. Cause once I've started, I want it to have like a consistent finished look and I want to use the same treatment at the end to whatever kind of corrections I'm doing. I want to be able to do that on every page so I get a coherent zine when I'm finished. And I mean, that method of working doesn't work for every artist and it may not even be serving me in this instance. All, like I said, all that erasing and I know I keep complaining about it, but it's wear and tear on your hands. And it also, you have to redraw things. It's just kind of a pain. And also kind of negates the point of using the non-photo blue to begin with. Because the non-photo blue is supposed to be something that you can drop out in post and it won't even be noticeable. So if it's causing wax resist, then it's not really serving. 
And that's another thing that when you're developing whatever process you're going to develop to do whatever kind of art you want to do, you need to think about, does your process serve you? And if it isn't serving you, do you want to continue the process for the sake of a coherent finished piece? Or do you want to drop the process? Like for Kara, it's such a long process, such a long comic that I have made, you know, a lot of process changes since I started. But this is just 31 days. And even with that, the this stage takes me such a long, I think I'm spending longer on this stage than I am doing the ink washes. So the stage really isn't, it isn't serving my needs. And one of the ways you can tell is, are you able to produce better art because of the stage or is it hindering your art? Is it, is it putting wear and tear on your body unnecessarily? Is it taking you a really long time? Is it the part of the process that you care about the most? Like the finishing touches or adding color, that sort of thing would be the, the part of the process that you care about most. If I'm spending this much time on the sketch phase, erasing and doing minor corrections so that I have a clean finished pencils, then I might as well just ink the thing. And then you also should think about your materials, how they are serving the process. You know, doing this in on mixed media paper, that worked great last year, um, but this year it's not really conducive to ink wash. It doesn't really take the ink wash the way I want it to. It's harder for me to blend. It doesn't do nice wet into wet techniques. So like a lot of the reasons I want to do ink wash are lost on this paper. This paper isn't a good fit. The ink I'm using, I'm using um, platinum, fountain pen ink, carbon black, that's what I'm using. And uh, it doesn't, you know, it would be easier and it would look better if I use black watercolor. I'm using water brushes because they're portable, but I hate water brushes and I have a lot of trouble controlling them. So all of these are things that in the future, I'm not gonna do it this way. I'm gonna finish my time and learn a lesson from it and not do it the same way because they're not serving the process and they're not serving the end result. They're not, it's not making me a stronger artist fighting those art supplies. It's just making me frustrated and it's making me unhappy with the work that I'm doing. So it's one of the reasons I review so many art supplies. It's why I talk about finding a good fit is if you're forcing yourself to use something that makes you hate what you do. And I'm not saying that any of this makes me hate what I do, but I know a lot of younger artists, oh, I hate such and such. Well, why are you, what, what are you using? Oh, I'm using the cheapest ones they make. Well, and for me, just not enjoying this combination of materials. I do like the blue pencil on this paper. I don't like my choice to erase all my underdrawing. I don't like my choice of materials in terms of uh, my ink wash materials. So I'm sharing all this, not to just complain at you guys, but because this is, you know, we're taught, even art school people are taught that uh, it's a poor artist who blames their tools. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of tools that aren't a good fit for you. Maybe they're great for your favorite artist, but they're not good for you personally. Or maybe there's a combination of tools that just isn't suiting the needs of the comic or the illustration or whatever you're drawing. So I think talking about that and normalizing it and analyzing it for you guys. So you're, you become used to analyzing it and hearing it analyzed, it's normal for you. I have a pushy gray cat and he's not helping the process either, huh Bowie? No, not helping the process, getting in the way, always in the way. And I keep doing this to like stretch, pop my hands because I'm putting, I'm already heavy handed. I already bared down on my pencil like it's my worst enemy. And then erasing, I'm bearing down with the eraser. So I'm really putting a lot of wear and tear onto my drawing hand and that's not good. So in another way, this process is potentially shortening my comic life, my, my time I can spend 
being a comic artist. And again, I'm not pointing all this out to you guys just to complain, but I want I want you to learn how to analyze these things because we're not taught how to analyze these things. And not everybody, not everybody naturally has that skill set. I don't, for example. That's that's you know an acquired skill for me. And then, you know, we do have a lot of pressure from like artists we admire. Well, I use such and such, you know, and we assume we have to use what they use and we'll, not be, we'll never be good if we're not using exactly what they use and we can't go find our own thing. But if it doesn't work for you and you're not tied to the, to the materials you're using for the project, then switch it out for something that serves you and helps you make the best art you can make. If you really do a great job with Crayola color pencils, you've used them for 15 years and you're great at it, then don't let anything I say dissuade you from using what works for you. Don't let anything any other artist say dissuade you. I mean, you should be open to trying new things, but like at the end of the day, if you still like those Crayola color pencils, if they still do the job for you, then don't switch out. Use what works for you, use what makes you happy. And what you can afford. I mean, if everybody else has Copic and all you can afford are Crayola Super Tips, I got tutorials to help you use those Crayola Super Tips and get blending techniques. Like, you don't have to use the Copics if that's what you can't, if you can't afford it, then you can't afford it. Don't ever take my reviews as me indicating, not that anybody's ever complained about this, but you know. Uh, don't don't take my reviews as any indication that what you're using right now is a is the worst choice or is a bad choice. I'm just trying to help people find stuff that'll work for them. If you've already got something that works for you, ignore what I say. It doesn't matter. On that note, my like ideal con is like an art supply con where we all just sit around and play with cool art supplies and find new favorites. And teach each other cool tricks. The big areas aren't so bad. It's the tight fiddly areas on the face where like I could potentially lose half the face by erasing that make me a little screamy. Son here looks like he would eventually marry a townie. No, a house, a house location and try to live that double life. This is a face of someone who could potentially learn to like chocolate and sugar. Of someone who might be able to be convinced to raid garbage cans and grow sweet peas in a backyard. This is a kid who could potentially enjoy being able to go hunt and come home to all the ease of domesticity that comes from living in proximity with humans. So basically he would go for Rowan's lifestyle. I think his mom will come visit him at least. His dad, I don't know. His dad is already looking pretty nonplussed about this whole, whole situation. I don't know what he imagined life was gonna be like. And uh, considering traditional Lilliputians or traditionalist Lilliputians, they probably, she and he probably knew each other since infancy, since traditionalists tend to live in family groups. Maybe she's from like the next settlement over. So like I said, her clothing is very plain because and I'm gonna add a, a little frayed edge. Because traditionalists don't usually adorn clothing for themselves. 
which is a comparison to Kara's mom, who is a professional, like her profession is seamstress and she's the best in her area. And she spends, well, not on Kara's clothes necessarily, but she spends a lot of time adding embellishments for other Lilliputians clothes or resizing things to fit. All right, uh, I guess that's about ready for tomorrow inking. And I will record that for you guys, but I'll do it in a separate video because I know this has gotten kind of long. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you have, whoa, that's always good when I get butterfingers and basically throw my lead pencil at my drawing. Um, I know, let's see. If you have any questions for me regarding, um, you know, constructive figure drawing, constructive human anatomy, that sort of thing, let me know in the comments below. I do have some other videos to help you guys out and I am working on creating even more so that, you know, those of you who want to learn the skill set are able to do so. I highly recommend you practice. Practice makes perfect. Don't just draw your characters, draw things from reference. And I hope you guys will check out some of my other drawing tutorials here on this channel. If you want to see me complete this piece, stick around. The inking demonstration for this should be coming up, knock on wood, soon. And uh, I'll see you guys again really soon. Bye, guys.